It's about the history of the railways in Britain um, from the very beginnings and really and truly how they made the modern world possible, um, how we could not really exist without railways and this we kind of take it for granted. Um, and Beamish is just part of that whole story. So it's, it's been interesting. I found out loads of things I never knew. It's been good. It's been great. That's great. I mean, uh, walking around the co-op was just extraordinary. And, you know, all this. I mean, I grew up, or I didn't grow up in 1900, but I grew up with, you know, very much a lot of the products that were sort of on the shelves that in your lifetime probably have disappeared. They were all still there. So for me, a lot of it is like, you know, memories of my mum and dad and my childhood. I really enjoyed it. It's very authentic. And at first it's kind of weird. You're sort of walking down the street and a, you know, an old style policeman walks past and then suddenly there's Jarro marches and then there's a very authentic, you know, 1930s bus and all that. It's very well done. I mean, I kind of, at first we were like, well, why can't we park our car here? And they're going, because it's a, you know, a 2015 car and you can't leave it in the middle of the high street. Like, okay. And you could have things like fish and chips. So I'm saying, can I have some ketchup? And they go, no, because it hasn't been invented yet. So, I think it's really well done. Oh, thanks for that one. Um, I think probably something like, um, probably the Battle of Agincourt, when we absolutely stuffed the French, um, because it was just an amazing event in history, and because the English with their longbows, sort of, it was one of the great battles, uh, and the whole planning of it, and the way we, we won it, and we beat the French was just brilliant. Yeah, and it'd be a, it would have been a great period to be English, I suppose. Um, I would like to meet, I'd probably like to meet Henry VIII yeah. to say, were you really as much of a horrible, bloodthirsty monster as you were portrayed, or was there a kind of method in your madness? You can't really just go around beheading your wives. Um, I'd, yeah, I think he'd be fascinating, because I think there was a there was a very good sensitive side to him. He wrote a lot of music, and he was the part of a very different, a change in the whole history of the world. Um, but he was also very bloodthirsty. So I think, in a in a grisly kind of way, he'd be a very interesting guy to interview. Well, I'd probably ring me because I got all the answers. Um, I think, I mean, the person everybody rang, and I don't think he ever got one wrong. I don't remember him getting one. It was Stephen Fry. Um, I remember Jimmy Tarbert came on with Lisa, his daughter, and I said, have you got any you know, good phone of friends? He said, we've only got one, and whatever you ask him, he will know it. And I said, who is it? He said, I'll tell you later if we, if we get there. And eventually they needed to phone a friend. Uh, and I said, come on then, Jimmy. He said, it's Stephen Fry. And I went, oh, that's... It's not cheating, he's just an amazingly... I don't know how that guy gets so much information in his brain and does so many things in a single day and in between it all, tweets everything all the time. He's an amazing man, a very nice man actually, he's an amazing guy. Uh, and he would probably be the best phone a friend. If he was still alive, and sadly he's not, but a very good old friend of mine, um, Jeremy Beadle, his knowledge about things as well was amazing. Some people, I mean I'm quite good, but there are sort of areas, there are areas I know lots about, and certain areas I know nothing about. And people like Beadle and uh, Stephen Fry and a few others, they just have this amazing sort of, so they would know as much about history or ancient history as they would about football or pop music. Um, amazing people actually. I don't, um, I don't know, I think people think I'm a train spotter. I don't really, I don't get that excited about trains. Uh, sounds dull for I've spent the last four years. I've done something like 168,000 miles in the last three years filming trains. Um, I don't. I don't particularly like trains as such. I don't get excited by locomotives of a particular era or time or you know the, the make of them or whatever, which a lot of people do. I just love railways. I find railways, railways around the world have been incredible. What, what they do is they make life that much better and access possible uh, for people in places where they couldn't possibly otherwise actually get from A to B. So like when we were filming in the Congo, which is a really wild, dangerous country, and there was one railway for the whole region, uh, and you realise as you filmed it through these villages, because there were no roads at all, and thick jungle, and you thought without this railway, 
it would be completely impossible for these people to ever meet anybody else outside the village, ever get anywhere else. If you were a farmer or, or you know, you couldn't sell your goods anywhere. So the railway there just completely changed their world. The same in somewhere like Bolivia where the railway goes right over the Andes Mountains. And it's kind of like um like a request bus stop thing, but it's for a train. So ladies would just appear from behind a rock and put their hand up and the train would stop and they jump on. And without that railway, they just couldn't do anything. They would just be stuck in the, literally on the top of the mountain. So I really love the way that just railways open up the world. Mm. So that's good, I enjoy that. Probably the one in Zimbabwe, which was just the worst train I've ever travelled on. With some really scary people on the train, all drinking this strange African hooch. Um, and the train kept bouncing over the tracks. I kept thinking we were going to be derailed. Um, and also, and I've never seen this anywhere else in the world, uh, of all the trains we've been on, the doors get flying open. Literally, so you're going along looking out the track at 70 miles an hour, the door will fly up like that. So I, I don't know, we, we went through the night and uh, it was quite scary, this sort of whole thing, but we, I kept hearing strange noises and thumps and I'm sure people were falling off the train. It was just the most amazing journey. Um, I wouldn't recommend that one for your holidays. I'd like to see the Japanese railways uh, brought to Britain because they have these bullet trains that are just we we put a speedometer app on one of them and we did 208 miles an hour and I could carry on chatting like I'm talking to you. Uh, I had a cup of coffee which wasn't in any of this called again in the source it was just you know. The, the carriages are spotless, they actually smell nice, they pump this lavender stuff through the air conditioning. You've never got a train in Britain, you've got on a train in Britain where you said, oh this smells really nice. You just don't. Um, so they were, uh, the other thing about them is they are every single train in Japan, every single train we got on, and we got on little ones in pokey country villages and big ones in Tokyo, whatever, every single one was exactly on time, like to the second. And when I got back to the UK, I had to go up to Manchester to make a commercial. So I, I arrived from Japan on the Saturday night, having had no trains ever late at all for the last two or three weeks. And the first train I had to get on was from King's Cross to Manchester on a Sunday night. And it was like, I think, a quarter past six train. And it just said, uh, delay till seven o'clock. So everybody goes, oh, well, not too bad, seven o'clock, not bad. In Japan, they would be hanging themselves from trees if they were 45 minutes late. And then we got to Manchester. Um, and we're just pulling up outside Manchester Piccadilly Station. And a bloke comes on the intercom and says, well, ladies and gentlemen, I can only apologise. Um, the train will now wait here because of overrunning engineering works. And we sat there for another 45 minutes. So our train, the first train I've been on at all since I left Japan, was an hour and a half late. And we all just went, oh, well, not too bad. I'll still get to the pub before it shuts. It's unreal. And, and things like leaves on the line, anywhere else in the world, would just be a joke. You would never get a problem with leaves on the line. Somewhere like Canada, where they have these massive boulders coming down like the mountains and huge avalanches. And they deal with that, and the train still gets through every day of the year. They would laugh about leaves, so we, we desperately need to sort our railways out in this country. They're not good. In fact, they're hopeless.